Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jayesh, uh, PhD student in Computer Science Department at Stanford University. In this video, I'll be presenting slides from my thesis defense. I'll be talking about how modular thinking and coordination of such modules can allow us to build more effective decision making systems for the real world. So, when it comes to autonomous systems, it's kind of cliche to start with an example of autonomous vehicles given their mind share over the last decade. But autonomous systems have been important for a while to help us explore new and hazardous worlds, doing the boring jobs, and finding new efficiencies in various other domains. Reinforcement learning and the associated planning view underlie how we model and think about the autonomous decision-making systems. In reinforcement learning, as planning, we model a decision-making system as an agent receiving observations in the world and taking actions in the world to bring about some change, usually to achieve some end. We formalize this as the agent also receiving some rewards from the environment, and then the goal becomes to maximize the sum of rewards that is obtained over, so say, an episode or its lifetime. The agent usually learns to achieve this goal by feedback from constant trial and error. Human cognition has been a go-to for understanding how the decision-making systems could work. If you are familiar with Daniel, Karn uh, Daniel Kahneman's work and behavioral economics in describing human behavior, you would be quite familiar with its categorization between a fast system one and a slow system two. The fast intuitive system one acts reactively and directly, while the slow system two acts by deliberating. These have a very nice corollary to how we computationally define decision making entities, especially in the context of planning and reinforcement learning. The learning entity is parameterized by a function approximator, like a neural network, while the objective is still to maximize total rewards obtained. So if you're learning a policy directly, we term it as model series reinforcement learning. This is analogous to system one from Daniel Kahneman's work. However, if you're instead learning a model as well, we call it model-based reinforcement learning because it often involves planning with that model uh, with, and you can see that as deliberation, which is analogous to system two. Last few years, uh, the field of decision making has seen tremendous progress. Deep neural network based function approximation and immense compute has allowed scaling to high dimensional pixel observations, for example, as well as large continuous action problems. However, when it comes to deploying reinforcement learning systems in the real world, many challenges remain. We want decision-making systems to work with as little data as it can. That is, it should have small sample complexity. This is because it's hard to obtain data via trial and error in the real world. Given the expensive nature of many of the solution techniques, we want decision-making systems to generalize to related problems instead of learning solutions from scratch for each problem. So when it comes to building complex systems, even decision-making systems, the design principles become increasingly important. This has led to an increasing realization, a rather realization over the last decade that building design systems may have less to do with algorithms per se, and other requires bringing back the system perspective. An exploration of how the design principles of modularity can help build decisioning systems for the real world, where sample efficiency and generalization are of paramount importance. One way designers deal with the complexity of systems is by the principles of modularity. A model system is defined by two major ideas information encapsulation or abstraction. A complex system can often be broken into smaller independent pieces uh, which only deal with part of the problem. And secondly, a framework for integrated function 
where where give out where you're given the smaller pieces which are relatively independent we still need to coordinate them together to perform the task together modular design allows better integration of human domain knowledge and prize compared to completely black box designs in supervised le deep learning these ideas although implicit are making a lot of progress for different input modalities researchers pick and choose the appropriate feature starter for each kind of data choosing a representation as late as possible to perform a task we already saw how the formula of reinforcement learning separates out the decision making system into various entities principle modularity asks us but why stop there our policy could be broken into different components which are then coordinated together to give the best action similar principles would hold for designing the model used by a learning agent as well again these ideas are fairly old only with the advent of deep learning and its differentiable modules these old ideas are making a comeback so one way to think about these modules especially as a system designer is to think of them as ways to encode prior knowledge about the system we can try to classify the many ways into different types although they are although to be fair these are not always completely distinct first uh, there is a function modularity in the sense that the same structure can encode different function depending on their inputs then there is temporal modularity the different modules activate in different context and those modules cannot work at the same time uh, for an example would be the case of task decomposition into different sub tasks and the corresponding sub policies that might be hierarchically structured and finally the most obvious would be the architectural modularity that is the system itself is divided into various components based on the kind of inputs and outputs these modules might have different computational capabilities again this is fairly common in practice with modern deep learning for example using convolutional neural networks for image like inputs versus recurrent neural networks for time series data With that said, uh, my thesis contributes were these three broad themes in how the principles of modular design then come into play while designing decision-making systems based on planning and reinforcement learning. This may take the form of functional modularity, with satellite decision-making for a team of agents, with modules for agents and their interactions in a multi-agent system. Homogeneous agents who have the same policy structure can still learn to perform different roles because of the different observations. or it may take the form of temporal modularity with tasks broken into subtasks based on differences between predictions from different models or we might be able to modularize the architecture itself based on the known physics of the system these design decisions help us gain substantial sample efficiency improvements while resulting in solutions that generalize a lot better to related problems In this talk, uh, we'll discuss only two of these contributions in the interest of time. So I'll start with a structured yet fully expressive modules for modern mechanical systems. So usually, uh, we are interested in learning models of dynamic systems to make better predictions of the world. But predictions are seldom on their own. what we usually after is how those predictions can inform better decision making in the world for example consider this agent who is trying to decide between the red or the green button it would be useful if it could predict whether pressing the red or the green button is going to take it to a favorable or an unfavorable state moreover this decision making process is often a sequential one as i mentioned earlier having a model dynamic system can be very useful for making such decisions and there are various applications for such model predictive control especially in robotics where simulations of these predictions from the model can help plan trajectories for the robot one key factor that makes model learning very enticing 
is that compared to plane control policies, models tend to generalize a lot better. For example, the same model dynamical system, that is a robot hand, can allow opening a door as well as a drawer. When you look at the current state of the model learning or system identification literature, uh, which as it's called in various other fields, there are two distinct camps. One, where domain experts come in and design the model from first principles, with maybe some parameter tuning in the end. However, they usually suffer from a trade-off between model fidelity and speed. Given the complexity of the real world, often the practitioners ignore the difficult to model patterns for fast predictions and simulations. And if they don't, and try to build a high fidelity model of the system, the model is extremely slow to be useful for planning or control. The other perspective from AI or machine learning is to learn directly from data. However, model large function approximators like deep neural networks require large amounts of data to work, which can often be difficult for real world systems. But what's great about them is that they do not suffer that much from the trade-off between the model fidelity and speed. Not only are they capable of modeling all the patterns in the data due to their universal approximation capabilities, but given the amount of immense resources are being spent by engineers on making their routines fast, such models are often much faster to simulate. Again, the two clients are of course not completely distinct. Some recent works have tried combining their ideas. Usually, it goes about using first principles to come up with a model. Think F equal to MA. But maybe we missed modeling something, like another force F3. We can then train a machine learning model to fit the rest of well from the real data. Note, however, there's usually no physical constraints on the machine learning model pertaining to the domain. For example, a mechanical system would be, should be following the principles of conservation of energy. And it would be great if our machine learning model kept track of such things. And when it comes to any machine learning based approach to modeling a system, one has to deal with the standard bias trade off. Simpler white box models with fewer parameters to learn often bias the model by ignoring difficult patterns. More expressive black box models like neural networks can require a large amount of data to capture all the relevant patterns in data, and therefore, in, when there's limited data, can show high variance to do overfitting. Given the trade offs involved in the real world, we want the practitioner to be able to go beyond this binary choice and make the right trade-off for their particular problem. I'm sure we all remember the standard Newtonian description of equations of motion, F equal to MA. That is all the forces acting on a system, say the spin mass system, would be equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass. I'm sure you also remember about other properties of the system, like its potential energy, kinetic energy, and any other external forces acting on the system. So there's another beautiful principle in physics discovered in the 18th century called the principle of least action. It allows us to derive another way of describing the same system. So remember we had the kinetic energy and potential energy of the system. We can define this quantity, uh, quote unquote, action as some of difference between the kinetic energy and potential energy over a path taken by the system. In controlled spaces, the sum takes the form of an integral. If we come back to the spring mass system again for a second, it could have moved from a position Q1 to a position Q2. How do we know what path was taken? Was it any of the purple ones or was it the red one? One way to interpret this action is that the nature is lazy and this quote unquote action is the cost function that nature minimizes. 
So if we define the quantity given by the difference in kinetic energy and potential energy as a Lagrangian and try to minimize this action, uh, we get what's called the Euler Lagrange equation. This equation is just on the description of the dynamics of the system, same as Newton's F equal to M MA, albeit it's easier to formalize more complex problems in terms of Euler Lagrange equations rather than Newton's F equal to MA. For mechanical systems, we can define the potential energy as a function of position Q, the kinetic energy as a function of its mass and velocities, uh, and the general forces acting on the system as functions of position, velocity, and any other action inputs to the system. If we substitute these quantities into the oil Lagrange equations, we get what's called the manipulator equation. Maybe this looks a bit complicated, so let's understand each term. The first term is equivalent to mass times acceleration. The second term is the Coriolis force term and can be derived from the mass matrix, position, and velocity of the system. The third term is the gradient of the potential energy term and models the conservative forces like gravity and elastic spin force acting on the system. While the term on the right hand side models all the non conservative forces like external forces or friction or damping acting on the system. Notice the similarities to Newton's F equal to MA formulation. Since this equation is an ordinary differential equation, we can integrate it to make next state predictions. So, to quickly summarize the physics that we'll need, if we were to know the mass matrix, potential energy, and the force acting on a system, and we're given the current state of the system in terms of its position and velocity, we can find the next state uh, using the manipulator equation. The science machine learning approach would have been to fit a function approximator directly between the inputs and the outputs. We instead show how function approximators can be constrained by the physics bias, which are governing the system. And we will do so by modeling the system's mass matrix, the potential function, and the generalized forces acting on the system. And that's the structure we need to ensure in a dynamics function. So now the question is, how do we model these various components while allowing for full expressivity? Let's start with the mass matrix module. So we live in a universe where mass of an object is always positive, at least as far as we know. Therefore, when we are modeling the mass matrix, we need to make sure that our mass matrix is positive definite. One solution to this is to predict the Cholsey factor of the mass matrix instead. Now we can use a neural network that takes the portion of the system as input and outputs the parameters of a lower triangular matrix that forms the Cholsky factor of the mass matrix. Another thing we need to ensure from a numerical perspective is that the mass matrix is invertible. A simple solution is to add a bias terms or diagonal so that it remains large enough to not run into numerical issues when inverted. So doing the prediction of the Cholsky factor, we also add a constant bias term to the diagonal. Next up is modeling the potential energy function. Remember, we had to differentiate the potential function with respect to positions to compute the conservative forces. So that tells us it needed to be at least once differentiable. Now, if we want to learn the parameters theta of the potential energy function via gradient descent, we'll have to compute gradient with respect to theta. So this tells us that it needs to be twice differentiable. Now this is fairly easy to ensure if you use appropriate activation functions. So the values are out, but tan H and sigma L are all right. Finally, we come to generalized external forces acting on the system. In general, there are no constraints here. And therefore, if you know nothing, we can use a black box function approximator to model the forces acting on the system as a function of its position, velocities, and any other control inputs. 
However, sometimes we do have some prior knowledge about the structure of forces acting on the system. In that case, we can use that knowledge to inform the structure of forces acting on the system. For example, here the system is control affine, that is linear in the control inputs, or there are some velocity dependent viscous damping terms present. We can use neural networks to output, output these parameters instead. We could always use another neural network to model any residual phenomena not captured in our structure. One question might come to your mind, especially because of the bias variance curve I mentioned earlier. Did we lose some representation capacity in the process of providing physics based inductive bias in our structured, what seems like a gray box model? Notice that if mass matrix and the potential were constant as a function of position, which, are, which is technically representable by neural networks, the function approximator modeling a generalized force looks exactly the same as naive black box modeling approach. Therefore, our structural approach has the same representation capacity as the black box neural network. Uh, and so this neutral formulation is better termed as a structural black box approach. As we'll see later that this structure allows it to learn with a lot less data. So just to uh, remind ourselves, uh, the learning problem is simply a regression problem. It is given a data dataset. Our goal is to minimize the prediction error. This takes the form of minimizing the errors in positions and velocity predictions from a model f of theta. To scale with data, uh, we can sample many batches from the data dataset to compute a loss and compute gradients of the loss via standard auto differentiation machinery and optimize it via stochastic gradient descent. One of the goals of this project was to understand the role of prior knowledge in generalization. Compared to the black box neural net approach on the left and the white box system modeling on the right, we propose a general structured black box approach. Moreover, there are many ways to interpolate between these approaches. So let's see uh, what the data and requirements are for these different interpolations. <laughs> On the Acrobot domain, uh, we analyzed how much data did a given model require to generalize as well as a naive black box model. If we look at the figure on the right, we see the orders of magnitude difference in data required to learn a black box nullet model versus a white box model parameters. And as you can see, as we add more prior knowledge, like modeling the mass matrix, potential function, and the general forces acting on the system, referred to as MVF here, we can work with orders of magnitude less data. The data requirements keep getting smaller as you keep adding more structure and modeling fewer parameters with the neural network. This is expected, but it's useful to know that appropriate trade-off. Next, we'll see uh, how the data efficiency carries over to a diverse set of challenging domains and leads to effective model-based control. It first us on a variety of domains with different under attributed dynamics to verify that this our approach generalizes. By under actuated, we mean that we can't control all the joints. The task here is to sync up and stabilize. The systems are all non-linear and the dynamics can be chaotic. Robotic systems are almost always control assigned. That is, they're linear in the control inputs. They're kind of designed that way. Therefore, if a practitioner has no other knowledge about the domain, we recommend using what we call the SMMC, where C stands for control FI architecture, which has the modules for learning the mass matrix and the potential energy, as well as networks to output the control input Jacobian and disability forces not from the input. We confirm that this SMMC model requires a lot fewer samples to read. 
it's very low validation errors across several ads of domains compared to a black box approach. However, our goal was to learn useful models and not just get good prediction performance. And utility for our case is model-based control. So let's start with a quick background into how model-based control works. Given you have a model for a dynamical system, and your objective is to plan a trajectory that maximizes the sum of rewards obtained, we can set up a constrained optimization problem to maximize this objective while ensuring that the dynamics constraints are satisfied. Adding any other constraints like safety becomes fairly easy with such an approach. We can now throw this problem to a nonlinear so uh, solver to obtain what's called nominal trajectory to follow. This is the tra trajectory that the agent tries to follow during execution. Note though, the models are never perfect and there might be deviations when the agent tries to follow this trajectory. What we can do during execution is to use what's called a trajectory follower that tries to track this trajectory by using the feedback from any errors online. Let's see an example of how these models perform for control. We found that even for the same validation errors, SNMC models do a lot better at control performance. Experiments until now were all with IID data. An autonomous agent needs to collect its own data to perform its function. And that's where model-based reinforcement learning comes in. We just saw how, given a data set, we could learn a dynamics model from it. We then combined it with a trajectory planner to get a policy to interact with the real system. We can complete this loop by taking a trajectory obtained during execution and adding it to the data set to improve the model, giving us the standard model-based reinforcement learning loop. We use state-of-the-art model-based control methods that we previously saw using a direct co-location-based trajectory planner, which gives us the uh, tracking trajectory, and then using our time-varying linear quarterly regulator to track the trajectory online. Reinforcement learning, even model-based reinforcement learning, however, requires exploration. We use a very simple approach for uh, this uh, exploration in our experiments adding caution noise to the reference trajectory being tracked online to aid exploratory actions while keeping the system relatively stable. We compare across three models. We have the black box neural network with no structure or prior knowledge but then. We have a proposed track structured black box model with no prior knowledge except that it's a mechanical system. We also have the SMMC model that adds in the structure that the forces are control affine and there are other damping terms present. The video here shows the corresponding model's performance over training. The trajectory is a reference trajectory or, or the plan for trajectory optimization with the model, where the purpose trajectory is when actually followed online. As you can see uh, that, that the model with the most domain knowledge, SMC, learns the quickest within about 10, 15 interactions with the environment. Channel black box model follows it and is able, structured black box model follows it and is able to learn a good enough model after about 20 or 30 interactions. Naive black box model network, on the other hand, is not even able to explore well enough to learn a useful model even after 60 interactions. The key takeaway should be that the structural black box, which is technically equally expressive as the naive black box neural network, is vastly better for reinforcement learning than mechanical systems. And just to confirm, these will stay consistent across multiple runs for different scenes. So to, to summarize this section, we introduced structured modules for modeling and general mechanical systems 
that can easily incorporate any prior knowledge. We showed how this parameterization is effective for long horizon planning and found significant hardware efficiency gains with model-based reinforcement learning. Now let's see if we can do something interesting even without a full-blown dynamical system model. I'll talk about how decision-making large teams can be modularized into local agent behavior. So the agent may not be the only agent in the world, and there might be multiple agents trying to achieve their own objectives, which can each be modeled as performing reinforcement learning on their own. Interaction between these learning agents can be collaborative, competitive, or mixed. And these interactions often result in complex emergent behavior. Here we will focus on a subset of such multi-agent systems, a team of agents coordinating together to achieve a shared objective. Notice that the same principles hold when there are other agents in the environment. The centralized decision-making entity can respond to observations from all the agents and the environment. The majority of the past, as well as current work, including, for example, the StarCraft towards Grandmaster Agent, centralized the decision-making policy. Unfortunately, this means that the problem now has joint action space that quickly explodes as the number of agents in the team increases. Applying the principle of modularity, the idea would be to instead model the problem as independent decision-making agents and their policies. Each agent only needs to focus on their local observations and decide their local actions. Coordination can implicitly emerge in the process of learning to achieve the shared objective. Unfortunately, there's a catch. From the perspective of an agent's policy, the dynamics of the problem are now non-stationary as the other agents are learning as well and while and therefore changing their policies. Now the question is whether we can mitigate this problem. According to a recent paper by Justin Terry, one way to think about non-stationarity during learning is as a problem of information loss. Because other agents are changing their behavior, information gained by an agent by interaction with the environment quickly de deteriorates. Let's see how we can model this information gain and loss during learning. So we uh, can, we can, so let's let uh, information about after learning epoch T on agent uh, indexed by I be fancy I of T. The change in information after learning epoch is a combination of the information learned about the environment and the information learned about agents while subtracting the information about other agents that needs to be unlearned because their behavior is changed. Information learned about other agents will be proportional to how quickly information can transfer between entities during learning, as well as the degree of coordination required. Information to be unlearned is proportional to how much information other agents have learned, as well as the information they had previously about the other agents. From this perspective, it becomes clear that there is information to be unlearned because the information is decentralized. If the information was all centralized, then there would be nothing to unlearn. We already decentralized the problem with independent agents, with local observations and actions. If we can make the assumption that the agents are homogenous, that is, they have the same observation space and action space, meaning the same input and output sizes, we can centralize this information by sharing the parameters between all agent policies, since all information chain is reflected into the same set of parameters. This means we can avoid the problem of exploding joint action space, as we now have an effective action space of a single agent, but also mitigating the non stationarity in dynamics. 
This modularity assumption still leaves us with one concern. What if, uh, for the same observations, agents need to make different decisions for coordination as a team? The solution turns out to be quite simple. If we can define our agent identities as similar size inputs, we can condition the agent policies on the agent observation as well as its identity. This allows agents to learn different roles as required for coordination. In a single agent setting, once we have parameters or policies, the objective is to maximize the expected return. We can frame this as a policy optimization problem. Note, however, that this objective is not directly differentiable as functional policy parameters theta. So what we instead do is derive another way to compute these gradients, which are called policy gradients, and are estimated in a Monte Carlo fashion from sample rollouts in the environment. The intuition behind this gradient is what we want to increase the log probability of the actions that lead to higher returns in the environment. This gradient is stochastic and can have high variance. Therefore, there are various ways to stabilize this optimization problem. The great thing about parameter sharing is that it allows for a very simple way to bootstrap single agent reinforcement learning algorithms to the multi agent setting. Uh, and this, uh, how it's done kind of becomes just an implementation detail. One way would be to either share the rollouts of observation, action, reward tuples to a shared parameter server where we compute and apply the gradients, or do it in a more distributed fashion, computing policy gradients for each agent locally and sending over the gradients to be averaged and applied to the shared parameter server. So first, we compare our parameter sharing approach to the standard centralized or decentralized approaches. We compare these approaches on a variety of multi-agent problems to relatively few agents. For small problems uh, with fewer agents, we found that the parameter sharing performed better or at least similar to the best of centralized and decentralized policies, achieving similar returns on convergence. However, when we actually looked at their behavior, the results weren't as good as they need to be. For example, in this video, uh, the agents in the back are trying to push the, push the box forward because that's kind of the goal, move, move the box as much forward as the agents can. Uh, why, but because the agents are trying to push the box forward, the agents in the front have to try to keep it from falling. This is the result of the agent policies getting stuck in a bad local optima during optimization. And uh, we, as we saw in our experiment, we couldn't scale well with even larger number of agents. So we wondered whether the homogeneity assumption between the modules can allow us to do better. We realize that framing the problem as different agents sharing the same parameters for the policy allows us to design a very natural curriculum for the learning. This is because the learning problem is decoupled from the number of agents in the problem. The gains apply to the same shared set of parameters, no, no matter the number of agents. Um, with this simple insight, the difficult to task can be defined by the number of agents in the system and we notice a natural curriculum to this problem. We model the task distribution as a traditional distribution with maximum weight assigned to the current task. We define an average return threshold, uh, R here, and start with maximum weight on the simplest task uh, here in the two agent problem. Once this threshold is crossed, we change the task distribution so that the maximum weight is on the next task in difficulty levels. This goes on for a while, and the same set of parameters get trained in a variety of tasks. Somewhat surprisingly, the policy parameters so obtained generalize well across all tasks, a different number of agents, while even outperforming the policies directly trained on the specific task itself. As you can see in the video, uh, they are able to successfully carry the box forward to the end.
we even have user stories in the wild, not just replicating our results, but finding the applicable to other problems. To summarize the key takeaways, we saw how modularizing a team policy into local policies for each agent helped work around the problem of exploding action space for centralized control. We demonstrated how homogeneity between agents allowed sharing parameters and mitigating the problem of non-stationality with decentralized learning. We saw how parameter sharing also allowed for a natural curriculum that resulted in generalized policies scaling to tens of agents. To summarize the key takeaways, uh, uh, and to conclude the talk, I'll summarize my contributions again. In this talk, we saw two examples of how modular design principles allowed incorporating appropriate price for decision-making domains, which led to scalable solutions that were sample efficient and more generalizable. I want to list two concrete future directions work in this thesis. So, so in my talk, the purpose of modeling was to make predictions of the world and then via simulations, learn to plan or control actions uh, to adapt in the world in a scalable manner. But that's still quite a limiting view of how useful such models can be. We already saw the importance of our models being aware of the domain they specialize in. This means respecting the known physical principles, constraints, and symmetries. And this can have the added benefit of reduced data requirements and improved reliability. We already saw how modularity helped there. In this talk, I mostly focused on modeling of neural deterministic models, how we could have separate modules to quantify their uncertainties, not only to make predictions which we can rely upon, but also to guide their own active exploration in collecting more data from the world or inform our procedures for designing new experiments. Modularity can also help models be more interpretable, but this would also require designing better analysis and visualization tools to understand what our models are really doing, as well as to help us discover new insights with the real systems that we are modeling. Finally, as the success of deep learning has shown, to enable this, we need to think about general accessibility of our models. This includes public availability of our software and benchmark problems with extensible APIs that can enable faster scientific progress. In this talk, uh, I focus on designing a bunch of differential modules, which would then be combined together in some form to optimize a single shared objective. Uh, once that was done, it allowed us to train them via some form of gradient descent. We now know a lot about the mechanisms for dealing with vanishing, exploding, rapidly changing gradients, etc. as long as modules are optimizing a single shared objective. But my intuition is that some of the modularity can be recovered with appropriate composition of multiple modular objectives. We've already started seeing some of it in the context of adversarial training and generative adversarial nets in the context of supervised and supervised training. Some of it has also been explored in reinforcement learning in the form of uh, intrinsic curiosity objectives. However, I believe that ideas from game theory, especially mechanism design, can help us make this process less ad hoc. Thank you for listening to this talk. Uh, feel free to ask any questions you might have. Just shoot me an email. Thank you.